Scan the International DX Program from Adventist World Radio. Coming to you today from Sofia, Bulgaria, and the HFCC, or High Frequency Coordination Conference. I'm Jeff White. This program was researched and written in Indianapolis by Dr. Adrian Peterson and produced in the studios of WRMI, as well as here in Sofia. And today we're going to be telling you a little bit about, um, not so much about the conference here in Sofia, but about the 25th anniversary of the National Association of Shortwave Broadcasters. We have some people here at the conference to talk about that. We started this uh, interview last week. We'll continue with it today. Also, travel the world with the Great White Fleet, our Philippine DX reports, and the information on our contest, Rare, Unusual, Unique QSLs. Well, it was on Monday, December 16th, 1907, that the Great White Fleet steamed out of Hampton Roads, Virginia, at the beginning of a goodwill tour that took them to 20 ports on six continents, a voyage that lasted 14 months and traversed 46,000 miles across the world's largest oceans. It was a warm, cloudy morning, and President Theodore Roosevelt was on the deck of the presidential yacht Mayflower, and he saluted the more than 30 Navy vessels and 14,000 Navy and Marine personnel that set out on the most ambitious venture thus far in the entire history of the United States of America, an event that demonstrated the mighty power of his nation that was emerging widely into the international political arena. A total of 16 magnificent battleships, all newly painted in gleaming white with golden ornamentation upon the bow, steamed in a neat row at 400-yard intervals, flanked by four destroyers. Billowing black smoke announced that these ships were now set out on a course for diplomatic endeavors on an international scale that the world had never witnessed before. This majestic flotilla of naval power was under the direction of Admiral Robley Evans, and this was the final grand event in his notable career before retirement. The first port of call was at Port of Spain on the British island of Trinidad, at the edge of the Caribbean. The crew spent six days in coaling all of their vessels and in visiting throughout the island, which was not yet an international tourist destination in those days. They also celebrated a special Christmas on the island. On the occasion of the departure of the Great White Fleet, Governor Jackson held a fitting ceremony in which he complimented the Navy personnel on their good behavior on his island. The Great White Fleet crossed the equator on January 6th of the next year, 1908, and then steamed down the coastline of Brazil in South America. Here, the American ships were welcomed by several naval vessels from Brazil. After coaling at Rio de Janeiro and a multitude of festivities ashore, the American flotilla left on January 21st for the stormy Straits of Magellan at the bottom of the continent. Here they were met by a Navy vessel from Chile, which guided them safely through the turbulent and dangerous waters. Along the Pacific coast of the South American continent, the ships were welcomed at several ports, and they arrived back in their home waters at San Diego in California on April 14th. There were several ports of call in California and Washington, and then they left for Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, arriving on July 16th. Across the Pacific, they visited Auckland in New Zealand, and the Australian cities of Sydney and Melbourne, as well as Albany, on the southern coast of Western Australia. At their arrival in Sydney, a quarter million people came out to welcome the Great White Fleet. Next was Manila in the Philippines, and then Tokyo in Japan, where they were granted a most gracious welcome, which was described as an event that was overflowing with Japanese hospitality. Three Japanese destroyers welcomed and escorted the American ships, the newspaper Boyaki Shimpo printed a special edition to honor the arrival of the Great White Fleet, and 50,000 people celebrated with a torchlight parade. As they were passing Formosa on the way to Tokyo, they encountered a massive storm. One sailor was washed overboard by a huge wave, 
and another huge wave washed him up onto the deck of another nearby ship. The onward voyage of the Great White Fleet took them to Colombo, Ceylon. They celebrated their second Christmas in the Indian Ocean, and they traversed the Suez Canal, taking on coal again at Port Said. Several ships from the Great White Fleet went on to Messina, on the Italian island of Sicily, to provide relief supplies for survivors of the recent earthquake. The entire fleet reassembled at Gibraltar on February 6th and steamed out into the Atlantic for the final leg on their journey back home. On February 22nd, 1909, also a Monday, President Theodore Roosevelt was again on the deck of the Mayflower, this time to welcome home the men and the ships of his triumphant Great White Fleet, though on this occasion the weather was dull, windy, and rainy. We go back to the summer of the year 1907, a few months before the Great White Fleet set out on its epic journey, and two sets of forest wireless equipment were installed on the American Navy vessels Connecticut and Virginia. In September, test transmissions were carried out between the two ships and with station CC on Cape Cod. Although these test transmissions were conducted in haste and they were considered to be incomplete, yet they were described as being fairly successful. The Navy ordered 26 sets of the forest wireless equipment, transmitters and receivers, and these were manufactured in haste. At best, forest equipment had a reputation for poor quality, and there were no instruction manuals. Dr. Lee DeForest himself supervised the installation of his equipment into some of the ships of the Great White Fleet. The remaining sets of wireless equipment were sent to Rio de Janeiro prior to the arrival of the fleet for installation there by American Navy wireless electricians. On departure day from Hampton Roads, Forrest presented a live program broadcast from the deck of the ship Dolphin, which was anchored at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York. The program consisted of messages of goodwill and musical items. Swedish-born, 34-year-old opera singer Eugenia Farrar sang several songs, including the popular parlor song I Love You Truly, and this is considered to be the first live broadcast of a musical presentation. The wireless equipment on the USS Ohio, under the call sign DC, was considered to be the network control station for the Great White Fleet. On January 12, 1908, the ship's brass band made a broadcast for the benefit of the combined navies of Brazil and the United States. Many subsequent broadcasts were made from station DC for the benefit of passing ships and for amateurs living in each of the various ports of call. The forest equipment was a spark wireless transmitter modulated with a telephone mouthpiece. All transmitters were tuned to approximately the same wavelength. Some of the other ships that were equipped with the forest wireless sets also made program broadcasts while en route with the Great White Fleet. However, none of the 26 sets, most of which were operable, were taken into usage for naval communication. While anchored in San Francisco, the wireless personnel on board the Ohio procured several music recordings and a phonograph player, and these were used in subsequent wireless broadcasts. The broadcasts in San Francisco were picked up by station PH at Russian Hill, and the information was printed in a local newspaper report. Goodwill broadcasts consisting of music, interviews, speeches, and reports were made at each of the subsequent ports of call from transmitter DC on board the Ohio. In most of these locations, these radio broadcasts were the very first radio broadcasts in the history of those localities. At the end of the more than a year-long itinerary of the Great White Fleet, and with many successful program broadcasts transmitted at so many different locations, all of the wireless equipment was removed from each ship and placed into storage, permanent storage, and never used again. You're listening to WaveScan from Adventist World Radio. Send your comments and reception reports to WaveScan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229 in the United States. That's WaveScan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229 in the USA. Or you can email us at wavescan at awr.org. Our email once again, wavescan 
at awr.org. Thank you, Ellen. News reports from India state that devastating floods in the state of Jammu and Kashmir have inundated city and country areas with massive damage to buildings and infrastructure, including a heavy loss of life. This tragic flooding is described by some as the worst in recorded history for this verdant and productive Kashmiri Valley area, high in the Himalaya foothills. In a monitoring report from Jost Jacob, VU2JOS in Hyderabad, he confirms that all India Radio Kashmir in Srinagar, on both medium wave and short wave, is currently off the air. The Indian Air Force has been flying in relief supplies for stricken survivors, as well as airlifting people out by helicopter from flood-stricken locations. For a while, emergency radio programming was on the air from a 300-kilowatt medium-wave transmitter, though flood inundations at all radio and TV locations has forced the staff to abandon their facilities. The Indian Air Force is also flying in special FM radio equipment from Delhi in order to reestablish radio communications for residents in this flood-ravaged state. Well, last week here in Sofia, we began the first part of an interview with some personnel from the NASB, the National Association of Shortwave Broadcasters in the United States, who were here in Sofia for the HFCC conference to mark the 25th anniversary of the founding of the NASB. Today, we're going to continue with that interview with Cal Carter from Continental Electronics, George Ross from KTWR in Guam, and, of course, Jerry Plummer from WWCR in Nashville. Now you, you, you yourself have been uh, to a couple of NASB meetings, I think. Uh, actually, my, uh, for me, my first one was, uh, was earlier this year. Great okay. deal. Uh, Great yeah. yeah. deal, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So uh, it was a, a, a good chance to meet everybody and, uh, uh, and also the facility down there, uh, uh, Voice of America facility was uh, it's one of the best uh, broadcasting facilities I've been I've been in quite a few of them around the world television radio that was a magnificent tour uh, mm-hmm. they they gave us down there mm-hmm. you you have been uh, to a couple of HFCC conferences though now. Uh, that's correct <laughs> uh, that's correct and a good group of guys and uh, of course the uh, U.S. is well represented uh, well represented here now. Of course, I know you want to sell shortwave transmitters, and particularly now DRM transmitters, DRM-capable transmitters. But what about, I mean, is shortwave declining as much as people say it is? From the new sales on transmitters, yeah, I think people are waiting to see, uh, waiting to see DRM take off. And uh, if it does take off with, uh, of course, I'll be making a presentation here later on on uh, DRM, but uh, if it does take off in a couple uh, very critical uh, countries, uh, India and Brazil and Russia, if it would take off in the next few years, that could, uh, that could bring on a new wave of, uh, of development for, uh, for broadcasters for shortwave, and that would, of course, be uh, good for the manufacturers, including Continental, uh, bring on a new wave of uh, production and manufacturing. Mm-hmm. And, and even as some of the major shortwave broadcasters uh, from the past, VOA, IB, uh, BBC, and so on, uh, cut back, th- there are some countries, uh, countries in the Arab world and else, elsewhere that are still buying shortwave transmitters and still expanding, right? Uh, that's absolutely uh, uh, correct. Um, uh, they're doing a shortwave and also medium wave to get their, uh, to get their broadcasting uh, across. Uh, more recently, it's been, uh, been in the medium wave area, uh, but there, there are, you're right, there are people uh, buying shortwave transmitters, high power and low power, but... Uh, uh, we're hoping for DRM to really, really kick in here in the next, uh, you know, whether it's one or two years or three or five years, uh, to start that uh, going again. Well, speaking of uh, DRM, we have George Ross with us here from uh, KTWR in Guam, Transworld Radio. And you have been, uh, well, besides being, I think, probably one of the founding members also of uh, NASB, uh, you have been very involved in DRM transmissions lately. Yes, actually, this year we started broadcasting our first um, actual DRM broadcast to Japan from our KTWR station on Guam. Mm-hmm. 
And is this still going on? Yes, it is still going on. Uh, it's a, uh, is it a regular daily or weekly broadcast? Or it's something? a regular weekly broadcast, and the interesting thing was, due to a DRM test we did last year, not to Japan, Japan hobbyists or DXers started asking us, can you please do a broadcast to our location? And they came up with a listener survey to emphasize that, yes, we have the listeners that you can uh, rely upon to be listening to your broadcasts. And truly, we've been receiving numerous reception reports from this broadcast that we do. Now, are these people who have dedicated DRM receivers, or are they using software, or... Or how, how are they picking up the transmission? There is a mix. They are primarily listening with SDR radios. And then there are also a few that have the FunCube dongle that you may be familiar with. And, of course, there are a few radios as well, but primarily they are SDRs. Mm -hmm. And so you get a lot of response from Japan. We are getting a lot of response. And we're getting it regularly, which is the way it used to be with shortwave listening. So do you intend to continue with uh, DRM transmissions um, regularly? We're working to build up with DRM transmissions. As you're aware, due to our broadcasts into the Asia region, we have both India and Japan we're looking at, but we do need to build up a listener base before we proceed any further. Mm -hmm. India is kind of uh, in the development stage right now, right? Yes, their government has actually said that by the year 2017, all of their domestic broadcasts will be DRM. Mm -hmm. So that definitely makes the base for the 1.2 billion people in the population there to be listening to DRM. Now, uh, Cal, you're also on the DRM steering board. What is the situation with um, uh, radios in India? I mean, if they're, if they're making this big switch to, to DRM, they must know something or, or have, have great hopes about raid receivers in India. Uh, yeah, well, initially right now, uh, India does have, I think it's uh, 10 or 11 uh, uh, medium wave uh, transmitters have been installed and are operating in India. They've got over 70% of the population is covered. I think the goal within the next year or two is to have over 90% of the population area covered. Uh, the government in India has made an initial uh, commitment to buy I believe it's up to uh, somewhere between five and 10,000 receivers and uh, distribute those out. And uh, hopefully, uh, again, in the next year or two, either through government uh, distribution or through commercial sale, uh, DRM receivers will, uh, uh, will increase significantly, significantly enough, enough to get the price of the receivers down so they can be uh, affordable to uh, people in other areas of the world, too. So I assume you're keeping a close watch on that, George. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, uh, Jerry, Jerry Plummer, uh, regular um, guest host uh, here on, uh, on WaveScan, and you guys broadcast the program uh, on yeah. WWCR as we well. Do. We do. Um, you've been a member of NESB for many years now. Several years, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think WWCR was one of the early members of uh, uh, NASB, if I understand. And then a few years, we, after a hiatus, so we're pleased to come back and rejoin NASB. Uh, five, six years, six, seven years ago, I guess. Yeah. So now, as a um, as a commercial shortwave broadcaster, what do you see as the benefits of uh, belonging to NASB? Oh, there's many. Uh, just something like this today, being able to talk with George, the uh, who who has forgotten more about shortwave than I know, <laughs> and uh, and Cal, who's knows, Ditto. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who knows quite a bit about continental, and of course yourself. It uh, it gives us the ability to work with others of our area and and to get a knowledge base that would be otherwise totally unattainable. Uh, George himself uh, has been just extremely good in assisting uh, Brady, myself, and many others at HFCC, NASB, and just varied areas. And uh, There's a lot of synergy in associating with uh, uh, sister stations, if you will, of NASB, I believe. And that was the second part of an interview conducted here in Sofia, Bulgaria, at the High Frequency Coordination Conference, honoring the 25th anniversary of the National Association of Shortwave Broadcasters, NESB, in the United States. And we'll continue with a lot more material from Sophia in future editions of WaveScan. Right now, let's go to the Philippines. Here's Henry Umahai with his DX report for this month. 
Hello everyone, to our dear shortwave listeners, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the September 14th edition of the Philippine DX News. This report number 91. I'm Henry Omaday in Bacolod City, Negros, Occidental Central Philippines. Glad to be back and thank you for listening. Reception logs for August 2014. August 1, China Ratio International. On 11955 in Filipino, Prime Beijing at 1139, SIO 454, parallel 12070, SIO 444, August 2, ratio Nikkei on 9595 in Japanese at 1206, SIO 333, August 5, Boys of Korea on 11735 in Korean at 1155, SIO 3.30 August 10, Radio New Zealand International on 9.700 in English from Ranjitaki at 0.940 SAO 3.33 August 10, Adventist World Radio on 17.550 in Bicolano from Guam at 10.37 SAO 4.33 August 10, Radio Japan on 11.815 in Japanese from Yamata at 10.52 SAO 3.43 August 10, HHA Australia on 11.700 in Chinese from Konenora at 10.58 SAO 3.33 August 11, Voice of Vietnam on 12.020 in English at 12.42 SAO 2.33 August 12, Voice of Mongolia on 12.085 in English Premalan Batar at 0922 SAO 444 and August 23 All Angel Region 13710 English Prem Bangalore at 1409 SAO 444 We have a special QSL card just for you For your reception report please send to US dollar Written postage will be greatly appreciated And friends if you want to get the transcript of today's Philippines DX News Please visit http colon double four slash Philippines DX at wordpress.com. That's http colon double four slash Philippines DX at wordpress.com. Follow us also on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Philippines DX. Or you may want to send us your comments, suggestions, reception logs, and information to Philippines DX at yahoo.com that's p-i-l-i-p-i-n-a-s-t-x for Pilipinas dx at yahoo.com this has been Henry Omnay for Wavescan in Bacolod City, Negros, Occidental, Central Philippines saying mabuhay at maraming salamat po Thank you Henry Shortwave listeners, international radio monitors and DXers around the world are invited to search their collection of QSL cards and letters for rare, unusual and unique verifications You're invited to make up a list, up to five in number, of your QSLs in this collective category, and to write a short paragraph about each as an important part of our annual DX contest. Partial entries for this year's contest are considered to be valid. At the conclusion of the contest, we here at Wavescan are planning to write up and publish a detailed compilation of interesting information on a worldwide basis about the rare, unusual and unique QSLs that come to light in this way. This will be the first occasion in the history of international radio broadcasting for the compilation of such a QSL list, and you're all invited to submit entries. Full details on this remarkable contest are available on several websites, including ontheshortwaves.com, mt-shortwave.blogspot.com, dot com facebook dot com slash indian dx report slash posts alakesh gupta dot blogspot dot com slash two thousand fourteen slash zero six and of course on awr dot com and on awr dot com you can just search there do a search for wave scan and you'll find all the de- details of this DX contest. As an example of a rare, unusual, or unique QSL card, back during October 1989, our editor Adrian Peterson was in Eugene, Oregon, on an itinerary on behalf of Adventist World Radio. 
During the evening, he took the opportunity to tune the portable radio to the medium wave band and, coming in with a good signal, was stationed KSFO, San Francisco, on 560 kilohertz. A regular reception report produced a special comment on their colored QSL card, which identifies also their sister station, KYA, on 93FM. The chief engineer explained that normally their 5-kilowatt medium-wave signal is radiated via a two-tower directional array at night. However, a recent earthquake had damaged one of their towers, and at the time of Adrian's reception, they were using only one tower. In addition, the flow of grid electricity was interrupted, and they were on the air with the use of their emergency generator. For two days, they had no electricity in the studio, and they were operating the programming with storage batteries and flashlights. Surely this QSL is the only card issued for reception of medium wave KSFO San Francisco during their earthquake emergency. today's wave scan with the same music we began with not the same piece but the same organization it's the Sofia Cathedral Choir from the Sveta Nedelia Church which means Holy Sunday Church and this church is located right in front of us here we're in the Sofia Balkan Hotel in Sofia and just in front of us on the square Sveta Nedelia Square is the Sveta Nedelia Orthodox Church and this is the Sofia Cathedral Choir well, thanks for listening to WaveScan, the international DX program from AWR. Researched and written in Indianapolis by Adrian Peterson. Next week, the world's busiest airport, AWR, was there. We'll have more from the HFCC in Bulgaria, our Bangladesh DX report, and, of course, information on our DX contest, rare, unusual, and unique QSLs. Several QSL cards are available for your reports on this program. Send your AWR and KSDA Guam reception reports for WaveScan to the AWR address in Indianapolis that we'll mention in a moment, and also to the station your radio is tuned to, WRMI or WWCR or KVOH, or to the AWR relay stations that carry WaveScan. Our address is WaveScan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana. 46229 USA. That's WaveScan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229 USA. Our email address for your comments and suggestions is wavescan at awr.org. That's wavescan at awr.org. I'm Jeff White of WRMI. And very good listening to you from Sofia.